I think we'll get started here. We have a pretty busy uh, schedule for the next uh, hour or so. So uh, again, welcome everyone. Um, if people haven't already done it, uh, for those who just came in, you can just add your name, maybe your pronouns and your affiliation into the chat and that'd be awesome. Uh, welcome everyone to this evening's discussion. So this is Hindsight 2020, uh, a post pandemic lessons for the public sector seminar. I appreciate you all taking the time to join us today. Uh, my name is Tim Cronin. I'm the I'm a current MPA student and a graduate assistant here at UMass Boston. Uh, I'm also in my day job, the State Director for Climate Exchange Education and Research, which is a nonprofit that works to address the climate crisis through green jobs and uh, equitable investment in climate infrastructure. So uh, I'm very excited for this evening's discussion, and we kind of hope that this will be the first in a series of student-led seminars, uh, both at UMass Boston and at some of the participating institutions that have MPA programs that are here today. Um, and we can kind of explore these topics um, in public management and administration. Before we begin, I do wanna just give a shout out to a few folks who made this possible. Uh, obviously, thank you to our panelists for taking your time to and your in lending your expertise to this topic, um, as well as um, Jessica Wong, fellow graduate assistant and you know, the McCormick School for uh, Policy and Global Studies for their support. Also, thank you to uh, Professor Ahn, who is the director of the MPA program at UMass and a professor here uh, for your leadership uh, in the event and the assistance with the content. And then last but certainly, certainly not least is Jack Lee, the graduate program administrator and who was the unsung hero of this program, You know, making sure the communication was great, making sure everything looked great on that end, really couldn't have done it without you, you know, from planning to otherwise, um, you know, really appreciate it. So with that, um, I think we'll, We'll start transitioning to the next one. Just letting a few more people in. Yeah, so before I turn the mic over to the panelists, I just want to talk briefly about the format. So we'll start with introductions with the panelists, uh, and I'll share their information and their kind of LinkedIn in the chat so you can reach out to them if you're ever interested in following up. Uh, then we'll have a bit of a structured Q&A followed by some questions uh, from the audience. Uh, feel free to drop questions in the chat whenever. Just know we're going to get to them at the second half of the program. Um, and people also have an opportunity to ask a question verbally at the end too, and we'll, we'll get to that. So now without further ado, uh, let's turn it over to the panelists of you know, current MPA students uh, at the McCormick School who are all also public administrative practitioners. So we'll do some introductions and I think we'll start alphabetically with Kendi. So Kendi, do you wanna jump in first? This is fun, I get to go first. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Kendi Derival. I am a current MPA student here at <clears throat> UMass Boston. Um, just want to give a quick shout out again to Tim for um, for having me here, Professor Ahn, Professor Smith. Uh, do see you both. Thank you both again for being here. And, um, uh, my name is Kendi, as I mentioned. Uh, my background, I have a previous military background from uh, living in the military. I happen to be stationed here in Massachusetts which is where I continued to serve in the Marine Corps. And then from further applied for an internship here at the governor's office and was later on hired. Um, and now I'm officially part of the staff has been three years now where I work as employment coordinator and background coordinator for the governor's office. Um, I am part of, again, as I mentioned, I'm part of the MPA program and I will be graduating in the spring 2022. That's exciting. So can't wait. <laughs> Thank you. Great, great. And then we'll, uh, we'll turn it over to Alana. Hey, hello. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm freezing. I hope that's just on my end. Uh, so my name is Alana Hilton. I'm also a current MPA student uh, graduating in the spring of 2022. I am a program manager for the Affirmative Action Department and uh, sorry, Compliance and Monitoring at the Massachusetts Water Resources Authority. Um, I'm excited to be here. I am a Boston native. I'm a Dorchester uh, native. And I'm excited to be here and talk about, you know, the public sector and COVID. Okay, thanks, looking forward to it. Um, Luis, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure, uh, good evening, everyone. First of all, thank you all so much for taking the time to join us tonight. I'm sure you guys all are super hungry, super tired from your nine to five, but again, thank you all for joining us. I'm again, Luis, I'm also a Boston native like Alana. I'm from Hyde Park, but I live in Dorchester, go Dorchester. Um, 
currently an MPA student, uh, fall 2021 cohort, and I've been a legislative aide for State Senator Brendan Crayon for about a year and a half now. So I started just at the height of the pandemic in July of 2020, just after graduating from Hamilton, um, where I got a degree in political science. Um, and a lot of the work that I've been doing has been directly relevant to the pandemic, a lot of housing and environmental policy that I have been spearheading for the senator. Uh, but yeah, that's about it. Great. Thanks. And uh, last but not least, Patrick. Hi, my name is uh, Pat Smith. Uh, thanks. Yeah, all my thanks to Tim for putting this together. Um, I am a uh, lifelong Boston resident myself who escaped to the South Shore uh, when I returned home. Uh, I did a little over 20 years in the Army. I currently work for the Home Base Program, uh, which is a mental health program for veterans and families at Mass General Hospital. Um, I'm the Associate Director of veteran outreach and I direct all our special operations programming. Um, I'm a first year MPA student. I just graduated in August with my BA in sociology from UMass Boston. Uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to tonight. Great, great. And so I think we'll just jump in. Um, we have a, a number of questions here. Um, keep letting folks in as they come in. Uh, if folks have just jumped in, you can just add your name and your affiliation to the chat, introduce yourself. So I think we'll put the first question to you, Alana, um, and then open up to the wider panel of folks who want to add anything else. So I think, you know, during the pandemic, I think the spotlight, as we all know, is shined on frontline workers, but also to their leaders and managers. I uh, think of it, you know, administrators like Dr. Anthony Fauci, who became, you know, famous overnight. You know, at the same time, I think there's some new demands that are placed on public managers that, at least according to the literature and a lot of the kind of discussion now will remain in place in the post-pandemic world. And, you know, Alana, speaking from your experience you know, with the MWRA and, and otherwise, uh, you know, what kind of leadership profiles do you think will be most important going forward? Uh, so, yeah, that's a great question, Tim. I definitely think going forward, there's going to be uh, a really a necessity to challenge the sort of traditional conceptions of sort of what organizational leadership looks like in the public sector. So we have to be willing to challenge the organizational culture. I think leaders coming out of this need to be willing to be flexible. They need to be transparent and innovative um, in embracing these new you know, platforms that we're using, these new ways of doing things that are not traditional and that were sort of, sort of shunned in the public sector prior to this. Um, so I definitely think they need to get behind flex flexible policies. And I think that there are aspects that are not sort of inherent to a good leader or um, that are not talked about as much, such as empathy and humility. Um, you know, the leaders are going to need to be less rigid. They're going to be needing uh, to be a listening ear, active listening, uh, listening to their employees, listening to their staff, adjusting their policies, and really being transparent and innovative in how they move forward. Rick, does anyone else want to jump in and add anything to that from the panel? So I think actually there's something that builds off of that. And it's, you know, speaking of kind of innovation overall, I think when the when the pandemic started, I think, you know, the private sector moved to telework pretty rapidly, but uh, there was obviously quite a bit of a gap you know, in terms of both having the physical technology and sometimes the skills to operate in that environment. I think very similarly, obviously government had to as well to abide by, you know, the six foot distance and pandemic, you know, safety protocols. Um, but the difference between the private sector and the public sector is that the public sector was put right at the center of the response and didn't have the luxury, I think, to wait. So I guess this question we can direct to you, Kendi, because I think you're right at the center of this. You know, I wonder how did this kind of switch from in-person to remote work within the executive branch? You know, maybe you can talk a little bit about that and the process and some of the challenges that both happened then, but also remain, and you know, maybe what you hope remains the, the same, or how you how you hope that stays. Absolutely. Um, uh, I, I think one of the biggest challenges was the fact that the the, the governor's office, well, not just the, the governor's office, but overall, you know, the executive branch, moving. You know, this is probably like first time in a while where you have the entire executive branch working remote. Uh, it hasn't happened. At least I've never been aware of it. Even from my military background, it's never happened where we had to switch the entire, you know, army. And I'm pretty sure Patrick couldn't testify to that. 
where everybody's working at home, it's never happened. It's unheard of because our day-to-day -day jobs, some of the logistics that we need is right there at the office. So the biggest thing was to transition the entire office, um, you know, to working, to being remote. And, um, you know, that includes all the employees within the Commonwealth. Um, and then the second thing to that is the, you know, that you new, know, the uh, adaptation or the adjustment to technology, given the fact that now every new staff that we're, that we're hiring or that we're, you know, in the hiring process on the pipeline, we had to get, you know, computers and all that stuff, get, you know, all that technologies and good stuff ready for them. And the biggest thing now is, you know, some of them did have the training, some of them did not have that training that we need. And also the biggest encounter, the biggest, one of the biggest issues was uh, the question of VPN, how VPN kept on slowing down and that dropped almost like every day. Um, I, I know, Pat, you could definitely testify as well on your end where, you know, VPN connection will just lose that often time. And, you know, sometimes it would be four hours. And uh, again, it's not like they, they don't have the technology, but it's just the fact that it's a new system and it's a big adjustment. And, um, you know, that took some time, but um, but they've, they've done a great job about it, uh, you know, about, about, about getting this whole thing fixed because well, it's been a whole year now since I have not in, had any issue with VPN connections. So um, I think what, that was definitely a, a, a good, um, you know, um, how do you call it, a, a drill, a live drill, if you may say, that, that I think, you know, we all did pretty good at handling. So I think that was uh, good on their end. <laughs> Where other folks, other folks had any similar experiences, uh, any challenges that came from it, or you know, what do you think the future looks like of remote work in the, in the public sector? Alana? Yeah, I can jump in on that. Um, as far as the future of remote work, I definitely think remote work is the future. I think it's here to stay. Um, you know, I, like I mentioned, you know, as leaders need to be innovative, they need to find ways to incorporate it. Right now, we're doing a, an optional extension of telework for our employees. And it being optional, what that does is it, it inadvertently, it could create an opportunity to widen the gender pay and promotion disparities um, in the sense that more men are returning to work in person than women. I, there was an article in the Globe uh, this week and about you know somewhere in the 60s is the percent of men that have returned to in-person work, where women it's in the 50s. And while that's not a huge disparity, it is a disparity and it, you know, knowing that there was already a pay and gender gap before the pandemic, we have to be careful with remote work that it's not creating or widening that gap. So for instance, if women are deciding to telework more and men are in person and they're getting that FaceTime, we want to make sure and managers need to make sure that they're accounting for that and that, you know, in performance management through remote work, that we're making sure that we're addressing that and really building a system to make sure that that doesn't happen. Yeah, and so I guess, you know, I, I kind of transitioning a little bit towards some of the, you know, additional impacts that happened. You know, I think, you know, although telecommuting for government workers, uh, you know, can be counted, I think it's a success for the most part. I think once those workers were online and working, I think the nature of their jobs changed pretty rapidly. And one of the things that uh, at least the literature tends to, to say and a lot of kind of the fallout from the pandemic is that the need for mobilizing kind of decentralized but still coordinated responses by government became super important. And there just wasn't enough capacity for government to do it themselves, which required leaning on NGOs and the private sector and whatnot. And interesting that some of the best practices from this was you know collaborating on organizing and kind of the technical nature of management as well as just leveraging networks that already existed to then find those those NGOs and I think Patrick uh, talking to you before this panel you know I think you have a phenomenal experience with exactly this where you know you temporarily shifted your mission at home base so I didn't know if maybe you could discuss that a little bit discuss some of the impacts and some of the stuff you ended up doing with that and you know the background and the impact so that'd be awesome yeah, absolutely. So we had kind of a mini fire drill before COVID hit. Um, so we had a we have a two week program where we bring people or bring veterans in from all over the country um, for mental health treatment. And we had a flu outbreak, so we actually shut our doors about a, a week prior to COVID, you know, taking over. Um, it it kind of set us up for how COVID would look. We sh we shuttered all our programs, unfortunately. Um, at the time. And uh, it was, you know, we didn't know really where we were going to transition to after that as a, 
almost as 150 people in an organization. Um, about a week after the the official, you know, everything closed and it was supposed to be original 15 days at home, um, my executive director, General uh, Jack Hammond, got a call from uh, Governor Baker and asked him to stand up a thousand bed field hospital at the Boston Convention Center um, in three days. So, you know, leveraging, he, he has probably 30 veterans that work for him, you know, that are used to that, hey, build this in three days and set this up and infrastructure and everything that goes along with it. So he leaned on all 30 of us immediately, you know, we got to call it, I think 11 o'clock at night on, a, on, I think it was March 14th. And, we legitimately had a, a thousand bed field hospital set up at the convention center in, in a little over three and a half days. Um, so it kind of put us back into that environment that we thrive in where there's a lot of unknowns and we can kind of just, uh, you know, take the ball and run with it. Um, we ended up seeing close to 800 patients over a two month period. Um, it was a lot of long days. Uh, it was broken into, um, two field hospitals. One was for the uh, Boston Healthcare for the Homeless and giving folks that um, didn't have a place to go or could not return home because they had COVID uh, a place to stay. And it also was a 500 bed field hospital for all the local hospitals to send people to open up that critical bed space at the time um, that they needed, whether it was in the emergency rooms or um, just people that couldn't go back home because they were still COVID positive, but were kind of on the incline and they were getting better. Um, so it was uh, it was a multidisciplinary, you name it. There was people from every hospital in Boston that worked there. We had um, you know security issues with having to bring in you know BPD, the state police, um, the National Guard had some augmentees, uh, and it was really just an around the clock operation with you know, close to a thousand um, employees that never worked together before. Um, there was probably only about, I would say 10% of us that had, you know, famil familiarity with the people within the organization. Um, and, you know, we, we really kind of, it was an excellent, you know, disaster response, I guess, and, and the whole city came together, which was pretty neat. Uh, there was, you know, donations from any, everyone you can imagine, people just really looking to help us. Um, and it was just a overarching, just a really great experience. Um, but one that I think that our military background really set us up for, for, and I think that's one of the reasons that Governor Baker had reached out to my big boss, um, just because he had had, you know, a lot of experience and a lot of us had, you know, doing that that type of mission, whether it was in the military side, but now returning home, it was kind of, it was pretty hot warming to be able to use some of the things that, you know, I learned in the military to, you know, help fellow citizens that were definitely in need um, in a pretty, you know, dark time when nobody really knew what was going to become of COVID at that time. Um, so it was, it was really a pretty worthwhile experience overall. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I wonder, other panelists, were there any instances that you can think of or that, uh, you know, were a, a change either temporary or permanent in the mission of your organization, um, even ones that are still here? Luis? Yeah, I can kind of speak to how the legislator was responding to the pandemic. So I'll, I'll be quite frank, the state was not adequately prepared to address a public health crisis like a pandemic. Um, and one of the main ways that we weren't prepared was in terms of coordination. So state agencies that were tasked with, you know, responding, whether it be housing, education, um, workforce development, um, food, you name it, um, there was just no coordination between those agencies, within those agencies. So then when it came to addressing constituent concerns, when folks were applying for assistance, it became extremely tasking to get everyone on the same page. So what we saw um, was um, the establishment of a directory in the Senate and in the House where we were working together to get all the liaisons, government relations liaisons from each agency to agree on uh, establishing a line of communication when it came to constituent casework. So that's one way. Um, I think another way was we just got a new CRM system. So we had to work with um, Senator Brownsberger's office and a few other folks to get that spearheaded during the pandemic, which made it even more difficult to um, keep track of casework. Uh, but in the long term, what that did was it streamlined um, uh, communication with constituents and with agencies. Um, so I do think that 
um, there, there was a lot of tech innovation going on, a lot of innovation within government and finding out ways to better coordinate. Yeah, and that, I guess continuing with you, Luis, and kind of continue to jump on this, I think, you know, communication, obviously important, as you just mentioned. And I think one of the most striking things that, that I saw was that the role that legislative policy staff played in communicating kind of options for assistance to the public, think of unemployment and whatnot, um, and in some ways really becoming like frontline advocates for constituents who really just needed assistance and just couldn't navigate, was a complex and changing bureaucracy. So I wonder, could you talk a little bit more about that and kind of I guess specifically how that interaction between the people and government changed and how it's it's going to change going forward. Absolutely. I think um, for starters, my role became primarily focused on um, unemployment casework. So on a given week uh, between July of 2020 and January of 2021, I had about 20 to 30 constituent cases. Um, in which folks were either delayed in terms of getting their assistance, they were confused as to why there were holds on their accounts, um, why they were denied. Some folks were applying for assistance that they didn't qualify for. For example, if someone uh, suffered a, uh, an, an, an injury um, and were on temporary leave, you don't qualify for unemployment because you have to be willing and able to work. And there's a separate short-term disability program that's established for folks like that. Um, so we had folks were applying, getting assistance in the in the interim, and then when their cases were being investigated and getting flagged, they ended up owing the state tens of thousands of dollars because they were receiving benefits that they didn't qualify for, right? So um, one way that we tried to um, avoid that from happening or, or, you know, recurring so many times was making sure that constituents were well aware of all the resources that were available to them in a, in a one-stop shop. So we created a one-pager in my office in terms of all the state agencies that were tasked with assistance, whether it be veterans affairs, housing, health, food. And what that did was it allowed folks to, one, learn more about those agencies, what they do, uh, contact us if they needed help. Um, and we had that in different languages, including Spanish, and we have two Spanish speakers in the office, including myself um, and another legislative aide. So it made it much easier to communicate with folks from the district um, as the senator represents a large Latino population in Lynn. And, and I know the other, other panelists, I think are, you know, you have your own kind of specific constituents and whatnot, but I wonder if there was any changes in how you communicated either to you know, the people that you used to work with um, or, or other individuals as well. Um, maybe also the nature of how you communicated too. Sure, it was all social media most, most of the time. So we went from email blasts to not being able to be in the district because of the pandemic. So we were focused primarily on engaging folks through Facebook, Instagram, the Senator created an Instagram, a Facebook, a Twitter. And that was how we were getting the word out to folks about uh, resources, upcoming opportunities, um, legislation, you name it. And we also created a newsletter um, that would go out in all of our posts on a monthly basis. Any other panelists want to add on to that? Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll quickly jump in on this one, uh, Luis. Uh, I think you and I have, you know, somewhat similar uh, background when it comes to our work. Uh, it's pretty much the same system to where, for instance, one of part of my job is to ensure that, you know, background, background checks and all that stuff in applications is being ran um, smoothly as far as like people that are applying for jobs and also, you know, maintaining uh, constant communication with the constituents as well on that level. So we had to, um, you know, my boss and I, we had to like create a different system where we would have just uh, aside from our personal email, uh, work email, we had another separate email that we could both control to ensure that constituent could email us directly if they had any questions uh, rather than just calling the office because there is no one at the office or rather than flooding our emails personally and not being able to keep track of it. Uh, so I do have the tracker right now open in front of me where again, still the same exact thing where we just go ahead and process that to ensure that that communication is still being constant because I think um, uh, I think I'm pretty sure all, all the pa uh, panelists have mentioned uh, accountability and uh, that um, that transparency was um, one thing that I, I'm pretty proud to say that Matt the state overall did a great job at being transparent as far as like some of the things that we needed to communicate with the uh with the with our constituents and uh, i'm pretty sure again everybody's satisfied with the service though there's still improvement to be made because again it's a system that we're all um getting used to and adjusting with uh, to uh, but i think it's definitely something that's you know that 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 was very big throughout the pandemic and you know and, and, and uh, moving on yeah yeah th thanks for that um you know i, I think 
shifting gears slightly, um, you know, one of the kind of recent impacts of the pandemic that is, I think, front and center here all the time on the radio and the news is the labor market. And, you know, historically, there's pretty high rates of vacant positions right now in the private sector. But interestingly enough, government has experienced its own version of this, driven in large part by early retirements among highly specialized and high skilled jobs that are, you know, frankly, wicked hard to fill. And uh, Alana, I didn't know maybe you want to kick us off on this one. Um, you know, maybe describe your experience with that, some of the ways that MWRA is responding to it. Yeah, so, um, you know, I'm really tasked with workforce management as one of my primary uh, roles uh, at the MWRA, and we definitely have had an issue with succession planning. Uh, with the, you know, sort of mass retirements, it, it's really hit us hard. We had more retirements in two months than we had, you know, all year last year. Um, and I'm talking about any sort of, you know, employees leaving the workforce. We had more retirements in two months than we had leave the workforce an entire year last year. Um, a lot of it has to do with um, this sort of triage ap approach. Um, instead of proper planning and sort of preventative planning, it seems like there's been a lot of, you know, no one really took it seriously until the pandemic hit. And when these mass retirements started happening and we're losing institutional knowledge, we have folks that have been in their jobs that have made their career in the public sector. You know, people come to MWRA and they stay for 30 years. So they're gatekeepers to that institutional knowledge. And when they leave and there's no one trained to take that position, it leaves a huge gap in, in, in our workforce. Um, you know, not only are we having issues with the lack of succession planning and the triage as opposed to preventative, we're also, you know, facing issues with recruitment. Um, there's a war on talent right now. Uh, the, the workforce has lost thousands and millions of, of you know, workers, and a lot of workers are choosing not to, to look for work. They're choosing not to rejoin the workforce right away. They're reevaluating, and, you know, that's made it more difficult as well. Um, you know, recruiting to human resources and high level executive jobs, you know, people aren't as are applying to these jobs as often. And these jobs have also become frontline for us. You know, HR is fielding calls from, you know, angry employees. We're dealing with vaccine mandates. Uh, you know, all of these different things are sort of compounding on top of each other. Um, another thing is salaries. Um, quite frankly, our salaries are not as competitive as the private sector, you know, we are competing against salaries that are maybe uh, double ours, what we can offer and benefit packages that offer, you know, a month of vacation time where we have two weeks entry level, no matter what position or how much experience you come in. Um, and then, you know, also we're dealing with unions. The union environment also sort of is a hindrance because as we approach them and you know thinking about innovative ways to address this and make changes, we have to go to unions to get job descriptions updated that haven't been updated for 30 years. Um, I, I definitely think another issue is the lack of a pathway or pipeline to employment within uh, our organization. I think that there has not been a formal performance management system put in place and that's definitely uh, showing up as a, a negative for us right now because we don't have professionals trained to take these high level executive jobs. And that's causing us to go outside of our own organization to recruit. Um, and that can also cause conflict internally when we hire to these high level positions and bring in folks from the outside. Um, you know, it's gonna cause flip conflict internally. Um, you know, it's also attracting a diverse workforce, um, you know, with our strict, you know, requirements for experience and education. So these are all things that when I say like future leaders need to be innovative when we're thinking about our workforce in the future and recruiting and succession planning, these are things that we need to think about and they're things that should have been planned for, you know, years ago. I think succession planning should be something that's done cyclically. It should be on a five-year basis or maybe even, you know, more often than that. But it's something that just was not happening. It's, you know, a buzzword that was thrown around a lot, um, you know, prior to COVID. Oh, you know, we need to get on succession planning. You know, we had a meeting a couple of years ago, but there was no action items, which is why when this hit, we were just sort of left with a big hole in our workforce in a lot of high-level positions. 
Oh, th thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing that. That's provides a pretty clear roadmap of some of the things that can be done. Uh, folks, do, do folks, uh, other folks have experiences with this as well? Patrick? I can speak to kind of the medical side of the house. So one of our big issues um, was um, licensure. So Massachusetts has some of the strictest licensing requirements when it comes to, you know, social workers or psychologists, psychiatrists, and their ability to um, work across state lines. Um, but it's not always carried over in every state. So you have to be licensed in New Hampshire to practice New Hampshire. You have to be licensed in Rhode Island to practice in Rhode Island. And a big issue that we faced, although they were relaxed for a period of time during the pandemic itself, um, they're now back to normal standards, is that, you know, Traditionally, people would come to our outpatient clinic from, you know, within an hour of Boston, and they could not do that because the clinic was closed and our um, clinicians were unable to practice across state lines. So mental health care, I think we've all seen, has taken a pretty huge uptick during this whole pandemic. Um, and the ability to reach people that were normally our patients was almost ceased overnight because we couldn't you know, technically talk to them in, in New Hampshire, for instance, you know, in someone that really needed to continue mental health treatment. Um, and we've learned, I think, over the past, you know, year and a half, two years that there needs to be a real solid look at the ability to practice, you know, mental health care across state lines, whether it's New York, New Jersey, you know, being able to to reach these people, um, you know, one of the positives that did come out of it is that people that would come to our clinic and it would be a four, three, four hour ride from Springfield to Boston, were able to now do telehealth. So that was a positive that we could continue to see them and they would no longer have to take that commute into town and it, and it opened up access within the Commonwealth itself. Um, but one of the things we're working on now with um, different, you know, whether it's through the legislative piece or just working through different other nonprofits that are more, you know, either globally or nationally is working on that, um, that piece where you can, you can reach patients where you need to reach them and they don't have to necessarily come to a traditional medical, you know, facility to get that treatment. Um, because we really are losing a, a huge swath of people right now that we can't reach because by law, it's, you know, it's against the law to practice with a patient that may have come through our program and now lives in Virginia. Um, so that's definitely a, a thing that we're working on. And I know our legislative branch of home base is, is taking a look at working both federally and state to try to, to kind of bridge that gap so that these, these folks have the ability to, you know, get the help, get the help that they really want or entitled to. And, and they really, a lot of them deserve it and need it. Thank you for that. Thank you for that perspective. Um, you know, I think last formal question, I think before we open up to the audience, um, you know, I think we really can't speak about 2020 and the pandemic and not talk about intersectionality. I think we have seen that the public health and economic impact of the pandemic has really exacerbated the existing inequities in the U.S. and it, I mean, in Massachusetts as well, you know, in, around things like race, class, and gender. And, and I'll open this up to the whole panel. So feel free to raise your hand or jump in. Um, but I don't know if anyone here could talk maybe a bit about you know, your experiences that you've witnessed in work or some of the legacies of the pandemic in addressing things like you know, racism within public administration. So yeah. Alana, did you raise your hand? So. Yeah, um, you know, I, I can definitely say as, as a black woman and, and working in this industry and, and seeing some of my colleagues leave the workforce for good, that's been really difficult. I think when we talk about intersectionality, we're talking about the layering of, you know, of someone's who they are. So, you know, I, I am a woman, but I'm a black woman. I'm a black woman. I'm also, you know, an, a child of an immigrant. And all of those different competing identities exist in me at once. And those are all things that I have different struggles that I face because of thinking about sort of how the pandemic has affected it. I think that we're talking about this idea of a 40 hour work week um, and that it's not something that when, you know, when society was built, <laughs> a 40 hour work week was built around a two, you know, a two parent household. 
it's really traditional. It's a, a mom and a dad and mom stays home and she takes care of the kids and she cooks and cleans and dad goes to work and he gets the paycheck and brings it home. That's not, that no longer is something you can stand on. Uh, first of all, one salary alone is not enough to support a household, to support a family, to feed and clothe your children. Um, and it's definitely something as a woman that it has been brought to the forefront that this sort of expectation um, that women thinking about single moms, thinking about you know women being primary caretakers and the fact that they have to leave the workforce to go take care of their children, that some of them aren't able to return or are not returning because of childcare. We're still in the pandemic. There is a school in JP that had to close for 10 days last week. What happens? Who's gonna, what parent is gonna take time off work for that? most likely it's going to be the woman. So I definitely think that the pandemic has really put a shining light on sort of the inequities and disparities in how our systems are built. And it's that's why I think flexible policies are gonna re be really important for the future of work um, and remote work in the future. Thank you. Other, other folks have any experiences that they wanna think of, oh, Luis? Yeah, I definitely agree in terms of like how these intersectionalities are coming about still, even during the pandemic. So again, we st uh, we had a moratorium on evictions for almost a year and a half. Um, we had folks who um, in, in the district are predominantly people of color who are low income, don't have a, a, a savings, a safety net to fall back on. Uh, the majority of which are the ones who are reaching out to our office for unemployment assistance because they're not too knowledgeable about how the system works. So we had an information gap. We had um, a gap in terms of folks who were waiting weeks, again, for unemployment assistance and didn't have the, the money or the disposable income then there to take care of themselves and their family. So you had folks who were then applying for food stamps, folks who were then applying for mass health, applying for RAFTA assistance, which is rental assistance for uh, families in transition. Um, and I think what this pandemic will show is that one, uh, there needs to be a system in place where more disposable income is being offered to folks at a quicker rate, especially during times of public health crises. Um, there needs to be more personnel and more personnel of color, especially working in government. I can tell you I'm one of few staffers in the Senate um, who are uh, people of color. Um, especially at this level of work and what ends up happening is, you know, um, I think that folks are more comfortable reaching out to government when they see folks who look like themselves um, representing them and who they can rely on um, to one, give them guidance in the process to support them, um, but also, you know, to give them hope. And I do think that the legislator has a long way to go in terms of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. But I also think that, again, coordination is so important. And I think the state needs to do a much better job of making sure that that happens. Mm -hmm. Kenny, did you unmute? Yeah, I was going to jump off real quick. But if I may slightly shift a little bit, I was going to bring in more. Um, totally agree with what you know both Alana and uh, Luis says. I was going to you know slightly shift a little bit towards the accountability side. Uh, as far as the leadership level at the top, and that's one thing that we need to ensure that you know uh, we 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 do better on as a state and as overall as a as a government agencies, um, you know because accountability is one thing is it's one thing when you're working for yourselves and it's something that's completely different when you're working on behalf of the people, and uh, that was one thing that needed to be highlighted a whole lot more throughout the pandemic. And um, it was very different because of the fact that, you know, um, you know, so many the, so many agencies that never used to work together, as Patrick mentioned, now I had to come together now to make sure that, OK, you know, how are we going to do this? How are we going to get this done? Uh, forgetting about our prim primary primary missions, but let ins let's ensure that, you know, but this is what this is what can be done at this level in this specific time frame. Um, because, again, the clock is ticking regardless and we were not ready for this. We're not prepared for it. So therefore, we had to ensure that uh, people that needed, for instance, unemployment assistance, then uh, DOA was closed at the time. So how would those people reach out for unemployment assistance or people that needed you know, that extra care, you know, men, mental health support? Um, how would they reach out, you know, to those people? So the system that we had in, we had in place, uh, is it functional and is it uh, efficient? If not, then how can we maneuver around that to make sure that, you know, not only that we're being accountable to ourselves, but that also that, you know, the individuals that were assisting 
uh, also receiving that, um, you know, that. So I think that was a big thing. And as far as, um, and also, if I may add, um, also making sure that, um, again, that transparency as well could also build up to it as well, whether people know exactly what's going on. They know that, uh, you know, that we are working. Uh, government works. That's one thing that, you know, I used to always hear that people say all the time, government doesn't work, government doesn't work, government, government doesn't work. But overall, it does work. It's very, it's a different pace than, you know, the military or the, on the, uh, than the uh, civilian sector. But if you look at, you know, the history in past decades, and then it shows that it does somewhat work. You just have to be patient about it. That's one, and know exactly how to access the information. And the biggest, one of the biggest thing I could say is a lot of people that oftentimes say government doesn't work is all the people that don't know how to access the information, which brings me to my next point is, you know, ensuring that the information is there and know how to access it, which, you know, which uh, Louise touched up on, you know, earlier, uh, you know, having those, you know, different agencies, whether, you know, it is the third parties that are, if we can spread the work through them, or whether there's a different board, for instance, Latin, Black and Latino advisory committees, which are the two committees that the, the governor set up uh, to ensure that those communities uh, are being you know, heard and that their concern of being transferred back um, you know, to the governor and to the office to ensure that uh, there is at least some kind of a communication set up where the people can understand and know exactly what's going on. So um, that's it really, thank you. Yeah, yeah, and I guess I guess on that note, any other panelists do have any other thoughts about this topic or any other things that we didn't get to before we open it up to questions? I know we covered a lot of ground, but it's never everything. I would just like to add that I think uh, just as looking at, into the future that we really need to think of work as something that we accomplish and not so much as a physical place that we go. And I think that that's something that the pandemic has has really drove home for me. Mm, thank you for that. And just to kind of talk about what you know Elena had said, you know, I think the pandemic has opened up doors to where, you know, for me, for instance, and you know, traditionally you would say that the you know the woman would stay home and and take care of the kids, but I think the pandemic has opened up the fact that where my wife can go to work in the morning and I can now stay home and put the kids in the bus so that I can be there for them. And then I can hop on a meeting, you know, from home as opposed to having to go to work every day at eight o'clock, which is nice. You know, it gives us, I think, both the flexibility to be able to both have full-time jobs and still, you know, take the burden off each other, which I think, I hope that doesn't end when the pandemic, you know, hopefully starts to wrap up that I can, where I would go to work every day from seven to three, I can now stay home and give her a break or she can give me a break or we can, you know, be more of a family unit, I guess, and help each other out more. Where I think in the past, it was really, you had to make the decision who was gonna stay home. And I think it's just, I think, I hope the pandemic continues to kind of grow off the, the flexibility that I think some of us have learned that you, you can just do your work just as well from home as you can driving into Boston every day. And it just, I think it'll be a more overarching worthwhile experience for the, for the family unit as a whole, if, you know, we can all chip in. Alana, did you have your hand up? Yeah, you know, Patrick, I think that that's a great message. And I hope that more men in the workforce have that attitude. I also want to point that out as definitely something that I think I forgot to mention as a challenge as we're thinking about the labor shortage uh, is remote work. Uh, I think a lot of folks are not looking for, you know, a 100% in-person work role right now. Uh, there's a lot of jobs that are just only remote. You can store it on a lot of job boards so that it only shows you results for jobs that are 100% remote. So that's going to be a challenge. And I definitely think uh, advertising that or putting that on our job postings alone, that maybe there's a 50-50 or it's a hybrid, is going to take some candidates out of the pool for us. So that's definitely going to be a challenge moving forward as we think about rebuilding our workforce. Great. So I think now we'll, uh, so if any other final thoughts, final hot takes, I think I took everyone's hot takes when I was discussing, talking with everyone in the weeks before, but uh, folks in the audience, if people want to raise their hand, uh, I'm having to call on you can ask your question verbally. If not, uh, we can also do questions via the chat. Give folks a second to think about that. So 
So one question I did get beforehand uh, via email actually was a question about, actually, I don't think we addressed this either. Um, you know, a question about like what you know, laws, policies, procedures, your organization developed to assist people in COVID that you think, you know, make the world better and, you know, should be, uh, should continue to be in place. That's what it was. Sorry, I had to read. Uh, Alana? Oh, did you have your hand up on that? I don't know. Yeah, it was from uh, before, but I would definitely say the telework policy. Yeah. Any other laws? Uh, yeah, I guess at Luis, because I know the Senate has been super active in passing a number of pieces of legislation. Uh, anything you hope stays that's slated for removal? Um, I wouldn't say slated for removal, but I think expanding paid family time leave and like just understanding what those benefits are, who qualifies for them, expanding uh, the pool of people who are qualified for, especially women who are having kids and, um, you know, single fathers, single mothers, making sure that they have those resources um, at their disposal when they need to. I will say, I think the moratorium on evictions and how it was written out legislatively was beautiful. And I think that uh, what we learned from this is that during times of of you know, public health crises, we have a, a established procedure now for how housing is gonna work with the economy and how the economy is gonna work with public health and education and all these different departments so that you know, services are still being delivered by government ineffectively and efficiently. And yes, there are a number of proposals now to uh, one, uh, reimburse uh, frontline workers for uh, their service. I think it's a bill that was put forth by the Senate president, a few, about giving them uh, a separate refund now. So they'll get a third check now for uh, their service. And I think it's a beautiful idea. They deserve it. They've worked hard and, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah see, so yeah, Professor Smith, you have your hand up. Are you able to unmute yourself? Oh, awesome. I can hear you. I think I am. Okay, good. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you all. Tim, this was um, really great. Thank you for organizing it. And it's been really nice to meet all of you virtually. I look forward to seeing, um, I think, all of you next semester um, in class. So I have a very similar question to the one you just asked. And my question is sort of the opposite. Has there been any, do any of you have an example of rules, procedures, guidelines, standards that needed to be met that were really unable to be done during COVID and your organization repealed them or got rid of them perhaps temporarily during COVID times but realized that they didn't make that much of a difference anyway and you're sticking with it. I, I think in the scholarly literature these are known as administrative burdens and I'm trying to get a set. I mean a lot of you talked about the forms that people have to fill out and the places they have to go and the information they have to get in order to get things they really need. Um, and that's really hard to navigate. And I'm wondering if there was anything that you or your organizations discovered that was unnecessary and eliminated it and you're gonna stick with not having it. Uh, let me let me try to jump in on that one. <laughs> Hi, Professor Smith. It's good to hear and see you again. Uh, uh, not per se in my office directly, but an often time that's one thing that a lot of offices, for instance, especially in state government, where, uh, for instance, if we never had that electronic system, right, um, of, you know, just a system filing, filing system, we never had that. And oftentimes it used to be file cabinet, file cabinet oftentimes. So one of the biggest switch now was setting up that electronic system, uh, you know, to ensure that let's just say certain um, non-confidential information, for instance, if we needed them, those documents, finding a way to actually get those documents, given the fact that our offices are closed now during setting up that electronic system. And the biggest thing was to make sure that or ensure that that share drive is available and accessible to all of those different employees that actually are um, in that office. And the biggest thing was, okay, if, you know, setting up that schedule to ensure that, okay, do we set that up? Are we gonna keep that? And the biggest thing is not only that it is a great idea, it was a good idea to actually set that up in a way, if I may say, but it also got rid of 
it created more space within the office environment itself, if that makes sense. Where now you were able to store a lot more stuff, you know, online, and we do have a safe and, um, and safe and sound system or shared drive or network that everybody can access remotely or in the office. And uh, now we can get rid of them having, you know, 10 different huge file cabinets. Now we can have five, we can downsize it to five, you know? So I think that was um, a good thing, especially on my end, uh, for instance, now that I have more space in my office now, which is good. So <laughs> I didn't have that before COVID, but now that I do have that, and I think that's something that they're definitely gonna keep around because I think it definitely makes a lot the job a lot easier. And uh, it says people, a lot of the constituents that we deal with, you know, a lot of time too, for instance, they having to drive all the way from Western Mass to come all the way here to drop off a package. Now they can just email it to us directly. And that saves them time, that saves them the commute, and it's very effective. And a lot of people say that it is more effective. Uh, and then the response time as well is even, it's even, it's even ridiculous. We can respond a lot easier via email. Like I'm always on my email or on the go on my phone. It's a lot easier to reply to that. So I think that was definitely one big implementation as far as like policy and that that's gonna stick around for a while. Yeah, Alana. Yeah, I completely agree with Kendi. Uh, a lot of the nature of the paperwork that I deal with is confidential. So it's just inherently never available electronically. Everything was inter office mail. And it's slowly creeping back in. You know, some folks that are, you know, that's the way that they prefer to do things. It's starting to happen more again. And it's something that I am advocating against. Um, I want to keep the electronic, uh, you know, filing system, document sharing, encryption around as long as we can. Um, another policy that is, you know, that potentially could be taken away is uh, interviewing. Uh, the uh, web access, the platform we use, it's just like Zoom, but doing these virtual interviews instead of having to drive for me to South Borough or Deer Island or all of these different locations that we have offices to do in-person interviews. I think it's really a, a testament to the fact that we have been able to hire, onboard, and train very well employees over a virtual platform. And I think that that's something that in some form should stay. Luis? Absolutely. Continuing along that vein of virtual, I think um, most hearings in the past, and especially in the Senate side, were held in person so that folks could give their testimony. And one thing that we learned during the pandemic is that we can have hearings that are equally as effective virtually. So the, the Senate held uh, housing committee uh, hearings uh, on Zoom, and folks would come provide their testimony, could comment in the chat, raise their hand, and uh, folks uh, you know, got really knowledgeable about how Zoom and all the uh, conference platforms work. So that wasn't an issue. And I think what, what we learned from this is that it's a time saver, a money saver, an energy saver, a personnel saver, savers in so many different ways. And I think, um, I think the legislator can, uh, will plan to continue uh, virtual briefings even after the pandemic. I can just add to that too. I'm not too sure if you touched up on that, Louis. Um, uh, but uh, I think one thing that one big change. I don't. I don't know if that is really a policy. If I want to call it a policy, but uh, the a lot of office or in different agencies actually, especially here in state government, has given their employees the opportunity or the options to work. You know, to come to be flexible, more flexible when it comes to time management and whether or not if they want to come to the office once or twice a week or you know however you know whatever works for them. For instance, in my office, uh, my uh, my direct you know supervisor and my boss gave me the options of coming into work uh, twice, two to three times a week per my schedule, and match that with my school schedule. So that made it a lot easier for me now because uh, I leave I live in Johnston, Rhode Island. I commute to Boston every day, almost every day. Uh, that was back then. Um, now that I have the options of going to work early, I, I go to work on Mondays usually now, and then I have enough time to leave to make it to class and then take the train back to South Station and then take the commuter rail back here or to just drive, vice versa, Mondays and Wednesdays, and then Tuesday, Thursday, still be in the office, your know, Friday be in the office, however long I'm able to play around with my schedule. So I think that's definitely something just like Alana, I believe mentioned earlier, uh, when a lot of people now instead of, you know, a lot of people that are looking to come back in the workforce, they're looking for that option to know whether or not you do, you know, certain offices do offer that, um, that, uh, you know, that remote uh, work, you know, uh, ability. And um, if it is possible to a lot of people, I think that will definitely drive uh, and what not, it, it will definitely, it's already shifting our market and our job market. A lot of people are looking for that now. And I think that's something that overall the entire state is uh, and has to do a better job at 
and ensuring at least certain, you know, certain jobs, of course, it's not possible, but for the most part, um, certain administrative jobs and, you know, some of the jobs that are able to offer that, I think that will be definitely attract a lot more people and employees as well, so. Absolutely, Kendi, and I'll actually add that I think the legislator is moving towards allowing uh, personnel that uh, come from central or western uh, mass or far in the south shore to work from home most days of the week and not have to come into office every day. Um, and one that saves people a lot of time in travel and aggravation, um, but also it just makes them more effective and productive workers during the day. You're not wasting an hour, hour and a half in traffic to get to the state house. Now you can work from home, uh, get things done, and also have a presence in the district physically, uh, which may come in handy during certain times. So I would say look out for that. Ooh, ooh, we got a bit of a scoop from Luis. Um, now hopefully the state house news service is listening right now, um, or hopefully they are. Um, I guess last question here, I know we're approaching seven, um, uh, but I wanna make sure to get this in. Uh, Ville said in the chat, and hopefully I am characterizing the question right, you know, are, I, essentially are certain kind of internal processes that are required of you all as employees or, or as managers of individuals, you know, are those kind of, a, a, I guess, a sense of control over remote workers? Um, and, and I guess kind of what does that, that mean overall? Um, I guess even this comes in that this kind of addresses or touches on a similar thing of, you know, the question of what do managers do when people are working remotely, uh, you know, how to be effective as a manager, you know, that kind of question. Uh, Bill, hopefully I have that correct. Sorry if I don't, but Ken, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I want to jump in. Hi, Bill. Thanks again for the question. Uh, I think the biggest thing here to understand is that um, if, I'm, if I may say, this is where accountability plays a role, right? This is where you understand the nature of your work and you understand that um, you, you are working not for yourself. Again, as I mentioned earlier, you working for the people, you're working for the constituents that elected you or the, 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 the agency that hired you uh, will hold you accountable for you know your actions as far as like they know that, OK, you know, you're not going to be stuck behind a computer nine to five, things like that. But it's just understanding the nature of your work and understanding that if you take your job seriously, then you will ensure that you do you hold yourself accountable because you know you're not gonna have somebody to babysit you if I may say I don't for for, for better lack of words or, or you know or you're not gonna have somebody to just you know this is not like high school if I may say uh, you know what I mean this is where you know this is grown up conversation this is grown up folks and you need to you know and understand and have that self accountability and discipline to know that okay this is what I have to do. I'm gonna make sure I go ahead and do it, and and the and I think that I, that's something that I um I didn't get the chance to share earlier. It's um where it's you have to have that uh, mental discipline to be able to balance the two. Where if when you're at home, you're still working, but you're at home. You know, there you're gonna be comfortable, but having that mental note or that mental state of mind where you're able to balance the two while still be able to work and then still you know have that break time or or you have to, you know, attend to your family or whatever it is. I think that's something that a lot of people, you know, struggle with in the beginning of the, throughout the pandemic and at the very beginning of the pandemic. And, you know, some people are probably still struggling with that. Uh, but, you know, that, that brings me back to say that accountability is the biggest thing. And uh, me personally, um, uh, from, a, from a military background, I had to manage, you know, some of my Marines that were under my, under my care um, at a certain time. But it got to a point where I've come to trust them and I've come to know that when they that when they have the job, I'm not going to time them to get it done because I know eventually they will get it done. And the biggest thing is in understanding and communicating effectively to know that not only your subordinates and that everybody understand, understands the task that is at hand, but they know that how time sensitive it is, if it is time sensitive, and also understand that this is something that we all have to do as a teamwork in order to get the work, the job done. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Alana, do you wanna build off that? Yeah, um, I agree with everything Kendi said. And I, I definitely think, you know, I'm talking about how we have, you know, successfully onboarded, trained employees during the pandemic. I think it's really, you know, the piece about performance management is something that a lot of folks have questions about. How do we measure someone's productivity? How do we know that, you know, they logged in when they were supposed to? How do we track them? And how much of that tracking then becomes invasive? Um, or, you know, how much of it is it handholding? You know, we want to make sure that we're providing some sort of a measure, but that we're not being, you know, overbearing, that we're not doing too much. I think that what happens or, you know, what really needs to happen is it becomes a prof professional development thing. 
where it's not necessarily a performance management, like, oh, how many cases did you work on this week or this or that? It's okay, you have benchmarks, you have goals. I think it really, it calls for managers to rise to the challenge to actually manage their staff in a way that they haven't had to in the past or more hands-on than they have had to in the past. Um, definitely creating, you know, performance development plans for every single one of your employees and making sure that you're checking in on them, not on a daily basis, but, you know, on a weekly basis. You know, I have weekly supervision with my new hire to make sure that he's on track for where he needs to be. I'm not calling him every day to make sure that he's logged in or that he's done enough emails or he's, he's you know, that's not necessary, but definitely professional development. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to build that off real quick, Tim, if I may say, yeah, I totally agree, Alana. And uh, that brings me, you know, that makes me uh, bring you back to say, even before I started, before the pandemic happened, uh, one thing that I started, I, me personally, I took the initiative of doing with my boss was every three months, every trimester, I would ask him, you know, for like overall performance, I would ask him because we usually have our meeting, like every Friday, we have a meeting at 11. And um, I've been doing that now for three years and I've not you know, stop doing it where, again, it's something that I've learned from the military where we have that accountability and that we have that counseling period every three months. So I've been doing that and it doesn't bother him. Every three months I would ask him, hey, how do you think I'm doing? Um, you know, what is it? Where do I lack? Where do I need to improve on? And then, you know, he'll tell me those feedbacks and then I'll make sure that I start asking, you know, I'm still asking those same questions. It doesn't change. And I usually ask him, okay, have I grown from this? Or if, I, if you were to task me out or if somebody were to approach you an external, if somebody from you know an external organization were to ask you, uh, would you trust or task Kendi out with doing this? Would you be comfortable, you know, uh, letting him handle this? So I would ask him those questions where he would challenge me, and then my report or my response would be, okay, I'm gonna take this, and I always write it down on my notebooks where I make sure that I work on that. And I've been doing that for three years now, so that's something again I've adopted. I've learned that from the military, and I kept them going. It keeps me in. It keeps me in line if I were to say it's not like I don't know or I don't know what to do and things like this, but it's again it's a lot of time developing that because at the end of the day it's uh, I have to grow from whatever place that I was 10 years ago, three years ago so personal growth is definitely something or personal development is definitely just something that I take at heart. And I think it's a good system where again if maybe if I have whenever I have other people under my charge, which I do, uh, maybe I might do something like this for them if they're interested, but then again I. It's avoiding that babysitting, if I may say for uh, better like words, that babysitting time where I'm, I'm always telling you how you're doing and things like this. Again, it's encouraging to do that, but um, me personally, I do it every three months and it doesn't bother me and it doesn't bother him as well. So um, yeah. There's a lot of lessons being, um, there's a lot of lessons here, uh, I think from you know, folks on the panel with military backgrounds and, and otherwise, so this is, this is great. Um, okay, so another question um, here, Chat's getting active uh, from Fiona, uh, fellow MPA student for Patrick. Uh, and I think the question goes, you know, for your employees uh, who continue to provide frontline support, have you developed any solutions to combat kind of compassion fatigue or any burnout? Uh, and I know Fiona works for Work Inc. So, you know, probably a question that you also consider Fiona, so. Yeah, just this kind of joking about Kendi, you can always tell the military guy because we always have notebooks like I have 50 notebooks in my house and I'm, right. I, never, I never leave the house without a notebook. <laughs> All my secrets are in that notebook. So um, yeah, we definitely took a huge and a hard look at at burnout because mental health is a pretty heavy field non pandemic. Um, and it's it's just the pandemic is, is exacerbated that um, you know, we do a lot of supervision within our clinicians and even um, our outreach coordinators, you know, we'll meet one on one with either a psychologist or a social worker and just kind of have that venting session and just talk about, um, you know, some of the cases we're seeing and because and, it does get heavy at times and it wears on you and, and burnout, you know, is a, is a real thing and it, it's and it's. Uh, you know, we've lost clinicians over the last year just because it, it just became too much. Um, but we've done a really good job with um, stipends for employees within home base where they can make the work environment more comfortable. So whether it's buying a new chair from Staples, getting something that makes their day job easier and just relieves that stress, that's great. Um, we've done uh, Zoom classes for wellness. We have a wellness team at home base. So we've done everything from 
employee nutrition, you know, classes where they'll cook a meal with our nutritionist at night over Zoom. Um, we'll do kind of socials at night uh, where families can be involved. Uh, we'll do yoga, Tai Chi, um, you know, art, anything you can really imagine to, to really just keep, because you're not seeing each other every day. So that team aspect is tough to keep. I think that's one of the things, the drawbacks is that face-to-face -face contact from the pandemic. Um, but we're trying to do a good job of getting the teams together, whether it's a coffee social every morning at 8.30, just to talk about, you know, they pick a book once a week and they read their book club and just trying to do as many things as we can to relieve that stress and just to give people an outlet to be able to talk um, so that you do, you know, have that supervision, whether it, they're an employee and they work for you or it's a peer and just check in on people and make sure that, um, you know, they're kind of staying ahead of the game mental health wise. And you know, I know on my team, I have blackout days where I'll have, you know, folks that are on my team that work for me, I'll be like, listen, today is a day where you don't turn your phone or your computer on. You just, you do you and, and hang out and do whatever makes you happy for the day. And I don't want you answering emails. I don't want you answering phone calls. Um, and I find that works pretty good. Um, and, you know, it is tough with supervision because you are on Zoom and you're not physically located with the person. But in the end, we're all adults, right? So we all at some point have to take ownership for our own actions. And I mean, as long as you're getting your work done, no one's really watching the clock, I think, during the pandemic. So, I mean, that's probably a good thing. But uh, just staying you know especially in the mental health world just making sure that you're taking care of each other and uh as well as you know the patients yeah. Lana, you want to build off that yeah i just wanted to say really quickly that i i think that everything that patrick said is right on point mental health is definitely at the forefront right now just in general uh for america as a whole and i'm sure the rest of you know the world uh, i definitely want to suggest affinity groups as something that's worked for us so, uh, you know, creating groups within your organization where employees can, you know, that have shared interests can have an outlet and it can be around mental health or it could be around a shared interest like soccer or, you know, it could be a sport or like, you know, Patrick said, cooking, creating those groups and safe spaces within the organization goes a long way uh, for sort of creating transparency. Great. Yeah. And I not to put Luis on the spot here, but I know that the Senate's been doing a lot of stuff. Oh, already has his hand up. Okay, cool. <laughs> I was ready for you, man. Um, so eight days ago, I'm sure you guys all saw, but the Senate passed a $3.82 billion bill um, on how to spend the ARPA funds. And uh, one of the major investments that they're doing is over 400 million in mental health alone. Um, and when it comes to mental health, it's not just um, investing in infrastructure. They're actually investing in uh, behavioral, behavior, God, I can't speak right now, behavioral health, um, um, telehealth, everything that has worked during the pandemic, expanding it so it becomes normalized even after, um, but also ensuring that we're offering grants to higher education institutions that are already doing this work um, so that we can learn from them as well. And I think one thing that I definitely appreciate is that now my healthcare coverage will cover a lot of telehealth and a lot of behavioral health uh, needs that I probably would have benefited from throughout the pandemic because, you know, working remote can get a little, a little depressing, um, but also just everything else that happened, um, you know, during the pandemic, I lost family members due to COVID. Um, I myself got sick with COVID and it was really tasking to uh, bounce back uh, from that and uh, do the work that was important. So great to see that happening at the state level. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Um, so I think we'll go to our final question because I did, you know, probably around 715 or so. So appreciate everyone still being on. So the final question is, you have a time machine. If you go back in time to February 2020, based off your other experiences or what you learned today, what would you tell yourself? Anyone want to jump in or might have to call on folks? Oh, Kendi. I'm going to jump in for this one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to be honest, when COVID happened, I had just got back from Florida from my brother's wedding. So I just literally the, the day that I just, uh, we flew down on, I think it was like what, Friday or Saturday? And then everything was shut down. I think like what the very end, like the very next day, Monday, we're told not to come to work. So that was a very big transition. Uh, but I would personally, I would tell myself uh, to learn as much as you can. Because uh, the reason why I say that is because it was tough in a way. 
for a lot of people that were hiring on a way because um, at that time, because again, they did not have that uh, office camaraderie, if that makes sense. And also they didn't have, they did not have anybody to kind of like teach them their job, their day-to-day job. Uh, they didn't have that. And it's hard to, at the time, Zoom wasn't as efficient. VPN was not as efficient. Um, EOTS were still setting things up on their end. So it, if, if you didn't really get the time to grasp as much as you could during those two, three weeks before COVID, everything shut down, uh, that, that's it. Whatever you had, that's all you had to work with. And it's tough because some people that were just being hired within those positions. So I think um, my biggest thing is to learn as much as you can. Always have, again, just like Patrick said, and I mean, I said earlier, I always have a notebook. Like I have like book um, notes worth uh, about maybe uh, maybe half half of this pretty much all of this most of it before COVID that I was learning and asking a lot of questions and to ensure that um, whatever happened to so not all I didn't know COVID was going to happen that's one but just again overall the idea was to uh, the intent my intention was to learn as much as I can for whatever situation so I can be prepared because I always tell myself in the military is always like this. You always got to learn the job of the person next to you or always know the job of somebody else, the person that you work with. Because again, it's the same thing that applies to combat. When you go to combat, pretty much you got to learn the other person to your left or to your right, their job. So that way, if they fall, you can pick it up and be able to cover it. So that was the mentality again that I have developed as well. So that's why I'm, again, I'm always taking notes and I'm always just dropping to what my boss is doing just to make sure I can learn it. And I'll tell them, hey, if you need to test me out with something else, I'll go ahead and take it for the time being. I'll learn it. I'll write it down. I'll refer back to it. But I'm also going to ask you, you know, the dumb questions that there's no stupid questions. I'm going to try that <laughs> just to ensure that at least, you know, I'm setting myself up for uh, success and also to make sure that I represent the people that I work with. Um, I want to represent them well. And I want to represent, you know, you guys well as well, which is why, again, it's important, again, to learn as much as you can. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for being on the panel, too. Okay, who else? What are, what's that, someone else going to say to their past self? Please. I would say take that trip to Puerto Rico, man. I had a, had my flights booked. I had a vacation planned. I had a, uh, the opportunity to see family. And I only say that because I did lose an uncle uh, during COVID who I will no longer be able to see. Um, and it was heartbreaking to go in March of this year um, and visit his grave and, you know, realize, you know, you take it, you take for granted all these moments with your family and your friends, and you never know, it could be your last. So I, I you know, it was a really humbling moment for me. Liner Patrick, any thoughts? I, I would have bought stock in Zoom. So that would, <laughs> if I went back, that would have been one of my number one things. I would not have told my children that we were going to take them to Disney World because I, every day I get reminded that because of COVID, they couldn't go to Disney World. Um, but I think, you know, kind of what Kendi said is just, I, I wish, you know, where we are now, and uh, I, it's tough to say, I, I, just, I really wish that I had more exposure to things that I didn't have pre-COVID. So the working with the healthcare for the homeless um, really opened my eyes to that huge issue that is kind of always nobody really wants to talk about it you know that the you know mass and cast what's happening now with the tents and I just I learned so much in that two months of working at the field hospital with those folks at healthcare from the homeless that it, it's one of my charges now that that I've really kind of gotten into and I just wish that if if I had it all back I wish I had more opportunity pre-COVID to have I guess attempted or, or experienced more than I did. And I'm, and I'm lucky now to experience, you know, how that whole piece works, but I wish I had more, I guess, openness to it pre-COVID. Thank you, uh, Alana. Yeah, I think uh, I would just tell myself that it's about to get real. Um, I would say be prepared more than anything. You know, I spent five years working for the Boston Minutemen Council as a district executive. And, you know, the, the motto for the Boy Scouts of America is be prepared. I don't think I ever really fully executed that until now. Um, so I definitely think I would tell myself that back then, but even going forward, like we really need to be prepared for anything. 
anything can happen. You know, there could be a new pandemic. There could be, you know, something unpredictable, you know, on the horizon that we don't know about. So just be prepared, be adaptable um, and be ready. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that. And thank you all for, for coming here, sharing your experiences, taking all these weird questions, thinking through this stuff. Uh, you know, I think we, it's hard to reflect and I think it's good to take some time to reflect over these past two years now almost. So thank you all. Thank you as well to all the, the folks who are you know, participants right now who are listening, all the people who are watching this recording in the future. Uh, hello. Um, so thank you all. And uh, yeah, hope you have a great day and uh, hope everyone learned something from this. So.